Welcome to Thinking Bros. My name is Chris. And I'm Alex. We're your favorite corner store philosophers trying to figure out life one conundrum at a time. And today we're going to be talking about the meaning of life. The highly anticipated episode. As promised. As promised. Now, its relation to the happiness episode is essentially we determined that if you follow the meaning of life... By the way, we can call it purpose or meaning of life. I, I saw some difference in my research of people saying, Oh, well, this is the purpose and this is the meaning. Let's just use them interchangeably. I don't see a, like, essentially we want to determine what do we have to do as humans in life, preferably. Yeah. And uh, bo both kind of mean the same thing. So the relation to the happiness episode is that we determine that you must follow your purpose in life to be happy. You shouldn't seek happiness in itself because that will be your way to fail at achieving happiness. And we put off the big task, which is to determine what is the meaning of life. So let's look at some let's look at some historical perspectives of big philosophers of what it is. Now I've divided this in three sections, which I called step one of the consideration of the meaning of life, step two, and step three. Could you just rapidly read out maybe two or three from step one? Yeah. So step one is meaningless. The first one here is absurdism, Albert Camus. So Camus believed that life is inherently absurd and lacks inherent meaning. However, he suggested that one should conf confront this absurdity with courage and live in revolt against it, finding meaning in the act of rebellion itself. There's... Yeah? yeah can you just rapidly read out the names of the other ones and maybe one more description? Uh, there's Nietzsche's nihilism, Sartre's existentialism, and Frankl's logotherapy. So, nihilism with Nietzsche... I mean, I, I'm not going to read your description, I guess, but what I got from it is, um, I had a course actually on this in school. They described it as uh, optimistic nihilism. So there's, there's no more meaning because apparently God is dead. And uh, basically the influence of religion is, is, is diminishing and there's no meaning to get from religion. And now we have no meaning in life, but it, he, ha he apparently has a positive outlook on it in that we can find our own meaning i mean we can kind of finish there uh what what i mean by meaningless is that step one in re is realizing that truly life is meaningless right so this is a phase that actually really bothered me and i was stuck in it from i'd say 15 to maybe 18 years old or i was like I thought you were going to say 15 to 18 minutes and you were really frustrated with it no no, no. i mean it's it's a reasonable phase to be stuck on but I would say you kind of have to get past it very quickly. And this is why I don't, I'm not sure I like reading people like Camus because it's like, yeah, we get it. Like absurd, I think absurdism is in there. I don't know. Maybe I didn't That's what you called it, give yeah. you time to read it. That's the first one I read. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, I think it, it's, it's just very obvious when you enter philosophical considerations. Okay, well, if you're a believer in science, let's say, you realize, okay, we're just ants on a burning rock right and nothing really matters so at that point it's it's more of a existential consideration it's not even a very philosophical but i think our outlook on the the big group of the um philosophical conclusions that life is meaningless and you must find your own meaning is the same as nihilism right as soon as you decide to live the meaning of life you must do something with your years, right? And in fact, considering everything we determined in the episode on happiness, you're going to feel much better if you decide to actually put some life in your years. As Abraham Lincoln said, it's not the years in your life that matter, but the life in your years. What pops into my head is the, our, our conclusion on nihilism and how it's, uh, I would say, self-fulfilling and just you described it as hypocritical i mean nihilism is is the the concept that life has no meaning and i think that if you live according to that presupposition that life has no meaning then it, it it'll be self-fulfilling and your life will indeed have no meaning in the sense that the, the way we we see and feel meaning i think is um you know having a purpose as we said we're going to use those interchangeably and doing something with your life being useful you know either to people to society or something and 
if your view is that life is meaningless and you're not going to do anything, you're going to lay in bed all day because anyway, it doesn't matter, then your life won't matter because you won't be doing anything. And so it's sort of counterproductive. Yeah. But do you see what I mean by saying that it, I mean, the consideration itself is a little bit meaningless and also their conclusion is that life is meaningless. But, you know, if we go back to the myth of Sisyphus, which, you know, in uh, Camus' work is, you know, the, the, the guy who is rolling a boulder. Punished, yeah, punished yeah. by the gods to roll a boulder for eternity up a mountain and then it just rolls back and he has, he has to just repeat the same thing every day. And it's a little bit of a parallel with the human condition where we just get out from get up from bed and then go to our nine to five. And Camus' conclusion was that you just have to find meaning in your routine, right? But I still feel like whatever, however many pages you waste on arriving at that point, you already shouldn't have wasted. You should waste the time determining what exactly it means to find meaning in your routine, what exactly it means to have a purpose, or what is the thing that you're already going to be doing? Like the consideration of, okay, the universe is huge, and if I do nothing in life or disappear now, absolutely nothing will change in the universe. That's kind of step one. And look, it took me two years or three years to get out of it, but apparently some philosophers dedicated their life to it, like absurdism. Uh, are there do you, do you know of good conclusions from absurdism or is the whole thing about absurdism just being like okay it's it's so funny how every breath we take which actually fuels us also oxidates us so we approach our death like is that a just a funny consideration or is there more to it uh, i don't i don't know i don't know of anything more more advanced from from absurdism we probably should read up on it or something but yeah it as you said it does seem um, like a futile inquire, inquiry to, to like, well, maybe, you know, maybe Camus hoped for another conclusion at the end of his investigation into his soul and... Well, actually, not, my bad, N not to be unfair to absurdism, because I read a book about absurdism, I forgot which one it was, but it was one of the popular ones, and the guy was collecting, I think he was spending his whole day on, on the balcony looking at people, and he was collecting expired okay. food coupons. And then as a reader, you're supposed to tell oh. yourself, oh, oh, wow, this is completely useless and absurd as an activity. But then if you realize that every other collection people make, right, every other collection activity people do is absolutely useless and changes nothing in their lives. So I think it also comments... Well, it changes something in their lives, but not in the universe, as you said. No, but in a meaningful way, I mean, because th there are layers, right? It's The absurdism isn't co going to comment necessarily on you know, finding love in your life. Okay. But it's going to comment on something like this, right? It's, it's, um, it what will, do you call it? Right? If, you, if you take it to the end, it will comment on, on finding love, right? It's, it's a somewhat a comment on your whole yeah, life. To, to, to be fair, but yeah. I, I think if you want to make it practical, then realizing the absurdity of being like, okay, I'm collecting these, uh, pop figurines of my favorite, I don't know, cartoon characters. And I'm reading this book where this guy's, collecting expired food stamps, you have to realize that, you have to make the parallel and realize that, oh, we're doing the exact same thing in the grand scheme of things. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean the grand scheme of things when you zoom out to the Milky Way. I mean, on this earth, right? Mm -hmm. We're accomplishing the same thing. We're collecting useless materialistic things. And in that sense, absurdism is kind of cool when you apply it to life, but you, are, you have to apply it to step two, right? You already have to be in this, okay, life has meaning, now, what are the things we do that we don't have the necessity of doing? Well, collecting things might be one of them, but finding love seems a little bit more deep, correct? And I understand, like, I agree. Yeah, But yeah. if you zoom out to the universe thing, well then, I mean, hey, getting up in the morning could be seen as absurd. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do see the distinction between, and I think the distinction comes from interactions with other people and what you can do for, for other people. I'm, I'm going to bring this up later when, you know, we, we give our opinions. Uh, but collecting stamps, you know, if, if that's your passion and makes you feel better, I, I, f I feel like that's okay to do. And it has meaning as long as it sustains your well-being insofar as later you're going to, you know, do something with your life that's more substantial, like, you know, finding love and, and, I don't know, doing your job, which has a purpose for other people. It seems like other people have a, a, 
a central point in. Certainly, yeah, that's step three, but spoilers. I wanted to comment on on Viktor Frankl's logotherapy. I have actually in in preparing for this briefly, I I had this book already, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, and he presents his logotherapy. So it's like a it, it's a psychotherapy that he created himself and the prefix logo basically in in um in greek means meaning well also word and and stuff like that but and thinking and yeah, reason. yeah. i mean basically means everything but <laughs> yeah logotherapy the, the goal of it is is to be is to mean meaning therapy and so he he finds the central point in life is um is finding a meaning and you're sort of right in including him in the meaningless part well at the same time no uh, I'm I'm gonna expand on that when I when I talk about my point of view. But let's move on to to step two. Step two, personal. Do you want me to read them out? Yeah. So first, there's utilitarianism. John Stuart Mill, the the moral philosophy that what you what is desirable is net happiness in the world, net pleasure or happiness. I think John Stuart Mill. Uh, confounded those uh platonism by plato uh do you want to talk about it so the reason i put them in the category of personal personal, personal is that it seems as though they have a little bit too much of a focus on themselves what was the first one you read uh utilitarianism to be fair utilitarianism considers everyone's pl um, pleasure and happiness equally, equally. but then again when you enter into things like hedonism, I think hedonism from Epicurus is uh, up there, uh, down there in the in the list. I think they have a, a little bit too much focus on the individual. And I had that impression yesterday. Now I'm trying to find it back because, yeah, utilitarianism considers everyone's pleasure equally, but it, it's still pleasure. And that sounds like a pretty individualistic thing, right? And although the everyone's pleasures are considered equally i would still say pleasure itself seems individualistic whereas something like happiness where you only have a, a vague idea of what it is until you listen to our episode of course <laughs> you you might attribute to it something like fulfillment but fulfillment isn't really found alone right you're not you're not you're not going to be necessarily fulfilled in in a Lamborghini, but you're probably going to be fulfilled or maybe, you know, something that vaguely res resembles happiness when you have a strong family bond and you're at a family dinner and everyone's healthy and, you know, something like that. It has a more of a communal outlook when you speak of happiness. Now, the problem with consequentialism as a whole, hedonism being one uh, sub part of it, hedonism being where the only thing that matters in the universe is the addition and subtraction of subtraction of um, pleasure net hap yeah net happiness net, net, net pleasure, pleasure for net, hedonism yeah. but whatever and the problem with being so mathematical is they have you you have to plug in one value and things like i've probably spoken about this example in the past but things like you know rings of criminals torturing one person the thing that is being subtracted from the universe is the the pain that the one person is feeling but as long as you get enough criminals that are super happy about it you can just get away with it and and it's the most moral thing to do yeah and there was a i think it makes more sense to put uh mill in the the personal the individual step of finding meaning as you designed it um because there are also other uh, other ways you can take utilitarianism I think John Stuart Mill's utilitarianism is called hedonistic utilitarianism. And so um, so the hedonism you put later sort of matches with that. But I think Mill didn't make a distinction between kinds of pleasures. And so it, it's, it and feels like... The, one of the biggest critiques towards him, right? Yeah, the doctrine of the swine is the biggest critique of, of, of Mill. Is that a doctrine like hedonistic utilitarianism where... All that matters is the net pleasure slash happiness, which is the same thing for him, uh, 
in the world. And so just sit in your room and eat cake all day and that brings you pleasure and that's good and you're like a pig you can you know roll in the mud and eat cake and you'll be good because that, that'll make you happy you'll and be moral and virtuous exactly which is what he's saying basically and then you know there's some replies that i don't remember but yeah but the replies are so horrible the replies were like okay instead of what's cheap entertainment at the time like eating an ice cream instead of eating an ice cream go to a theater and the way to justify higher pleasures from lower pleasures were yeah, that's that's Bentham's theory. B Bentham is another utilitarian, but he made a distinction between higher pleasures and lower pleasures. So lower pleasures were uh, common between us and animals, and higher pleasures were something that animals could not feel. And so, eating di dinner with your family, the sort of pleasure that 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 uh, brings, and you know that sort of goes into like more happiness and meaning, which which we were touching on than it does like our base instinct uh, desires but yeah yeah but i i remember that one of the ways to make the distinction was that people that like or enjoy often enjoy higher pleasures would identify it as a higher pleasure something like that it was like super no, no, circular no. do you remember that yeah yeah it, it was like um people who have the capacity to to identify it's not people that have the capacity to identify higher pleasures it's like people of a high enough intellect need to test the two activities and so a, a, a person that can uh, you have to have a certain sophistication to understand and enjoy reading a book right and you need to have that sophistication and then you make that person read a book and eat a cake and then the one that the person chooses every time is like the one that's the higher pleasure or whatever yeah yeah i remember hating that because it's so circular but it's pretty good to admin uh, to administer it to you know undergrad philosophy students. They they won't think he much of him. it. Okay, he is one. So okay, <laughs> um, yeah. It, it seems as though we're progressing towards something, and I think what's missing is this connection element. Where if you plug in pleasure, you you might enjoy human connection, you might enjoy social harmony, but you might not. And this is a problem mm -hmm. where I think. Yeah, that's the biggest thing I have against utilitarianism is that, you know, if you convince enough people in the world to be mean and they all subscribe to utilitarianism, then mm -hmm. let's say there are eight, eight billion and one person on earth and there is four billion and one person that is evil and four billion that are, <laughs> is not evil. The problem with utilitarianism is the four, <laughs> <laughs> the four billion people that are evil could simply do anything that pleases them and essentially well it's, it's not really that but essentially what's going to happen is if they maximize their pleasure it's going to trump the the good people maximizing the, their pleasure and it the earth could become a slaughter fest before you know it well let's go, go with something safer maybe seven billion people are evil one billion people uh or not evil. Yeah, yeah. It, it, they can just put it, put them in cages, and as long as it ha makes them happy enough, it's it's okay. It's 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 the best thing to do. It it's sort of intuitive in like the calculation of pleasure is sort of intuitive, but at the same time, you could say that you know what you're saying basically is you take like a one on one interaction between people, and I could say me torturing this person. Let's say I'm the person that's evil. Me torturing this person brings me so much pleasure. I'm ecstatic that it out. Uh, it beats that person's displeasure. And so the net happiness uh, goes up. And so it has like weird implications and just happiness, as I think we're, we're getting to, doesn't seem to be that meaningful in the end. Yeah, honestly, or I think it's more with uh, killing people where it's really easy to find the flaws with consequentialism because your exhilaration has to out-trump someone's pain while you're torturing them, which isn't as likely as oh if you end their life without them suffering then your joy will surely trump nothing well nothing they're they're not going to feel anything so the universe doesn't really lose especially if there were an unhappy person you're subtracting unhappiness from the universe anyway right, yeah, i yeah. think we've kind of you know it, hammered that in so we did can... you want to talk about buddhism because it feels weird to for you to have put it here i don't know much about buddhism oh i I think I misplaced it. It's probably. Can external. you read it? Can you read out the thing? Buddhism teaches 
that the meaning of life is to end suffering and attain enlightenment, nirvana, through the eightfold path, path, which includes right understanding, right intention, right action, and right mindfulness. Yeah, yeah. it's still you are the person getting enlightened. You are the person following these paths. I, I don't want to comment like a it, personal journey. I, I don't want to comment think? it c comment on it because I don't know that much about it. But isn't isn't the goal to like reconnect with nature and and you know the universe and become one with the universe? It's and then still seems like a solo quest because what actually should happen is you should connect with other humans, right? And we're gonna get to that step three. Okay. Um. And so just to to recon reconstruct this path, which I, I'm, I'm actually quite liking how you, how you built this. Step one is, is sort of the realization with, you know, the absence of religion in modern society, relative absence of religion, and with the advancement of science and uh, f humans feeling like they can explain everything, right, with science, with our advanced ways, we still find no answer to the meaning of life. And so you could go the, the way of, of uh, of some philosophers and say that, oh, life has no meaning and, and try to get a, a conclusion from that. But it seems useless because like, what are, what are you going to do? Not live your life to, to its fullest and, you know, just you live your whole life having in the back of your mind that it's, that it's useless and that it has no meaning. And then step two is to admit that it really does feel like life has a meaning and that you're supposed to be living and that you have a purpose, but being it, uh, it, it being more focused on on the personal, you know, either happiness or or pleasure. I mean, yeah. If I had to summarize uh, step one in a humoristic way, it would be if you live out your life, you know, with effort and you follow all your dreams until the end, and you live a fulfilling eighty years of your life. Versus if you go lay down on a beach somewhere right now and bathe in the sun and die of hunger. Absolutely nothing is going to change in the universe, but you shouldn't do the second thing still. Yeah, I mean, for me, sorry, we're going to move on to step three, but for me, the, the people that like endorse and put, put too much emphasis on step one of, of realizing that it doesn't seem obvious what the meaning of life is and their conclusion is that life has no meaning, is that, like, now what? Like, are, are you going to talk about it and keep talking about it and, and just... Uh, my my argument against this is that look if life truly has no meaning that it makes no difference if you die right now or if you live but you're not yourself so you know there's a meaning to life that that's sort of my step uh, my process step three is external you mentioned christianity various theologians <laughs> and confucianism in christian theology the meaning of life is to know love and serve god ultimately achieving salvation and eternal life through faith in jesus christ and Confucianism emphasizes the pursuit of moral and ethical development, fostering harmonious relationships within society. The meaning of life is found in the cultivation of virtue, family, and social harmony. I certainly think, you know, uh, Aristotle said to find the golden mean, right? The, the right balance between an exaggeration of a virtue and a lack of one. Uh, I mean, I guess a lack of one, right? Like from on the spectrum of being cowardly to being reckless reckless you should be you should find courage but to me every single virtue and i feel like there isn't enough focus on in platonism in aristotelian moral ethics there isn't enough focus on why and the why is usually because it will make you feel good and it will make you reach eudaimonia which is their word for fulfillment or happiness but what I think it's all about is other people, right? You're going to be courageous for whom? I mean, you know, in a naturalistic setting, it's going to be to defend your family from a lion, for example, if we go back a couple thousand years. Or, you know, these days is going to be standing up for something, for a cause. But what is a cause? A cause is something that will affect more than just you. It's, it's not often... You know, how, how many times are you put into situations where you have to display courage where it's only about you, right? I mean, okay, run away from the spider when no one's there. But when your loved one is there and 
you're afraid of the spider, you should confront the spider. And I think virtue is found more so in situations where you, you're supposed to, you know, take the spider out of the house if they don't want him killed or kill the spider. It's, it's not so much about yourself. It almost never is, I think. I mean, do you want to comment on, on Christianity or Buddhism? Or yeah, yeah. Or are well, you just you saying, know, yeah? I, obviously, you know, you know I'd take any way to, to hate on it. <laughs> but when it said you should reunite with God, it's like, you know how every time it says God, you can just interpret it as, you know, I don't know, connecting with virtue or whatever. You should, I think Christianity in that phrasing is so selfless. You should live for others in a way, right? And that's what it is. If you're not living for yourself, but for God, well, what God is is simply a, you know, a list of virtues that you should follow for the likes of others. And unfortunately, the way that is used to manipulate the motivation to achieve that is reaching heaven. So that's kind of selfish, and you could put it in step two. But at the very least, the fragment of life which we share which is the entirety of life, but let's, uh, let's assume an afterlife. The fragment of, the, of your life which we share is going to be selfless because you're going to be living for God. But when you, you know, in the afterlife, when you are going to reach heaven, um, that's when the selfishness comes in, in a way, which, I mean, let's not expand on that because we're probably going to have a, an episode on religion, but... Just in the in its phrasing, I like how it's phrased for others. And you can notice those things as people literally gather to go to church. And a church is often not a selfish thing, right? The reason you go there is because there's a community there. I know a lot of immigrants find their way or their place in the community by going to church in these new places. It's something that connects people. And I think that's beautiful. Yeah. And... Uh, Confucianism, I, I think, came at a time where there was a lot of there were a lot of wars and uh, social discord dominated everything, and the goal was to harmonize society and to you know the the, the ultimate goal was uh, social cohesiveness, and you know the political implications sometimes were uh, for people to conform a bit too much, but ultimately. The goal, the striving is to live harmoniously with other people, and that does seem more uh, more apt. Do, do we want to... Because I think what we're getting at is that we're at step three, and we we think we should live for, you know, other people and, and other things than ourselves. And do you, do you want to present our views? Well, you yeah, started, I, can, like, I can present my view. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my view is, you know, I'm writing a book in... It's it's clearly as we know, yeah. As, as I can I can never st stop mentioning, but I don't want to give away too much of my method to arrive at what exactly makes a moral consideration. But essentially, it's consequentialism with societal advancement as a as the variable, as the variable. And I think that putting it that way eliminates the likelihood that you can spin it so that evil people profit off of you know other people because it's not societally profitable to have a bunch of tortured people but but then you're faced with the burden of defining what societal advancement is of course now you know if i had to define an individual part to it we're, we're probably going to get to it in our discussion but the individual part would be what you deserve from our episode on what you deserve. And it would be fulfill your basic needs, right? You should be fed and uh, lodged, right? All of those things. So this is where the individual part comes in. Now, what you should do with those comforts is communal. In our unreleased episode on altruism, I've determined that your job must have a societally profitable goal, right? I argue that entertainment isn't necessarily that. I argue that models aren't necessarily that. 
and that a virtuous person person will probably do something that advances humanity, either by healing, for example. Of course, it goes much further than that. I wouldn't argue that there's a job hierarchy where janitors are lesser. Uh, I had this well, thought experiment. In fact, in fact, we talked about garbage men, and you put garbage men over models because models, in your opinion, exactly. don't contribute to society. Exactly. Yeah. I have two ca two distinct categories of if you remove them, the earth isn't the worst place. And um, yeah, let's just go with Janner. I, I had a little silly thought experiment of mm -hmm. uh, Oppenheimer's janitor, and it was basically Oppenheimer is pressed for time in discovering the atomic bomb, and he drops a jar on the f floor, and it doesn't break, but he doesn't have the time to wash it before doing the experiment, and he uses the jar for the experiment, and the experiment goes well because the the jar is clean because the floor was clean because the janitor did his job well. <laughs> and essentially, you can see how without the janitor, the earth wouldn't have advanced as much as without the presence of Oppenheimer. So that, I, as I said, I, I introduced it as, as silly, but essentially, I don't, I don't see a job hierarchy in terms of, okay, these people are, you know, replaceability only modifies how much you're paid for it. It doesn't make you any less useful. A great janitor in a school that brightens up, you know, the, the kids' days when when he passes by or something, is as valuable as you know any world leader. But I have a second category where if you remove them, it's not going to be a worse earth. And again, we can probably have uh, in a second episode on altruism, which we will release. <laughs> we can probably have a discussion of, of is entertainment useful at its core but but if you give me that assumption essentially i think your your job which takes up a third of your 24 hours should probably be outwardly or societally profitable and of course that encompasses maybe 90 percent of jobs we have now right uh, i don't know philosophers are those still around uh psychologists uh, kind of everything so kinda yeah and i talk about the puzzle i don't, I don't want to take up too much time can you can you I, give your reaction to what i've said now well i think we should stay on like our our definitions because i think some discussion will, will rise out of that okay well wait well now you tease the puzzle what what's the puzzle toes yeah the <laughs> what it's it's a past participle so the, the puzzle is just I don't know when we talked about it. I think it was in Happiness, right? It was about how any exploratory... It's Again, it's in my book. But any exploratory thing we do, let's say we travel, we're in search of the puzzle pieces of our lives. And when you find a puzzle piece, it just kind of kind of fits in. So let's say a loved one, right? You take the puzzle piece and then you have to look after it and then make other things fit around it. And when your puzzle is complete, that is happiness, but you also have to maintain it. Is just to give a quick summary. So what I'm saying is... The puzzle metaphor. The puzzle metaphor. So what I'm saying is, I think... Yeah, any, any exploration you do in life is to, to find the, the puzzle pieces and then after that is maintaining them, which is arguably even more work than searching for them. And I'm not sure how we contribute. I think it's more... It's, it's better in the happiness discussion. But one way it might fit is that Usually the the unmoving puzzle pieces, as I call them, let's say your family, your body, your I don't know your past, and the unmoving unmoving puzzle pieces are usually related to others, right? Your your family, your body is really how you're perceived in society. It's not much more than that, right? Your your body itself. I mean, you might be in bad health and it might make you feel bad, but you'll also be perceived differently. Then there's the aesthetic part. So usually the unmoving puzzle pieces are related to others. And what, what the unmoving puzzle pieces mean in the metaphor is that you have to find pieces that fit around them, right? You know, silly little example in a song we like. Uh, the singer Dave says, I fell in love with an Albanian girl. I know it's mad. Yeah, so what he means is that I think there's the culture clash and that his... Uh, family won't be accepting of that and both of their families won't be accepting of that which 
still seems crazy to me, but yeah. Yeah, it's 2023. That's not a thing. But what you have to realize is that there are certain pieces that you will never be able to have just because of the un unmoving pieces in your life. And you have to accept that. As soon as you accept that is as soon as it makes you happy or something like that. So the puzzle isn't the greatest metaphor for this situation, but I think we can go back to how everything... I, th I think you, ha you have to realize that what we are is truly just a species, of, uh, an advanced species of animal. And the way we arrive to be at the top of the food chain, at the top of whatever, at ruling Earth, is by collaborating. Because the biggest thing we have over other animals is they work for their survival. And if you were to define the virtue of a squirrel, it would be to stack up the right amount of nuts for themselves. And even then, they're probably surviving to then reproduce, but still. And a virtuous squirrel would probably run away from predators really fast. But what the reason why we're here, you know, with metal engines of, you know, mics and whatever, and it built houses, although birds are pretty good at that too, is that we collaborated, right? This house was built by someone else in the species. So a virtu virtue cannot be found in a personal journey, a squirrel-like personal journey. All I'm saying is that it must be outwardly in some sense, but I also think it must be outwardly in, in all senses. Once you reach what you deserve, aka the personal needs, everything else seems to be outwardly motivated. You have your job, then, I mean, I guess your, your nutrition, but then again, per, you know, personal basic needs. Um, you go to the gym probably to remain in good health, which is a, a personal basic need, but also to work on the aesthetic of your body, which only matters because it's perceived by others. What else do people do? Interests? I mean, mm -hmm. if you had a if you had a, an interest or a collection or something and absolutely not one person on earth would care about it, right? Would you still do it? I doubt that a lot of people would say yes. Correct? I mean, it's impressive to have, you know, the, the golden penny minted in 1822 by Abe Lincoln him, himself because seem, someone recognizes that that's impressive. Yeah, it does seem like the community of collectors around it is sort of what gives it its yeah, prestige, what's right? What's rarity? I mean, okay, sure, it's the number of times that it's repeated on Earth, but it's also the number of times people have it on Earth. Other people have it, yeah. Yeah, so... So, <laughs> um, yeah, it, it just seems that... I mean, maybe you can find a good counterexample, but it seems that everything you do, you do for others, but that doesn't necessarily have to mean that, oh, I should, you know, be late to my, to my work to open the door for somebody. The, the work that you do should be outwardly, outwardly motivated. And I think there's some balance in that. But again, I don't want to fall into the fallacy of being like, okay, it's consequentialism, but with societal advancement, I'm not going to explain what societal advancement is. I'm not, you should live for others, but also do all these things by yourself. I'm not going to explain what that is. So maybe you can find some kind of counterexamples to that. But well, uh, My comment on, on all of that, uh, which seems great, is what's like what's the basis for it because i know you've been you've been on record with your beliefs that <laughs> that you know uh human life doesn't have inherent meaning and uh there were some allusions to the fact that you know killing isn't inherently bad and there's no inherent value to human beings lives but then like the question is why why does societal advancement matter you know like Sure, it is what we act out in the world, and it does seem and feel right to help other people and everything, but what's the, what's the explanation of that? What's the metaphysics? All right, never say that again, but <laughs> he, here's my theory, and this is one of the biggest, problem I have, biggest problems I have with my book. It's that, okay, I know not everyone's going to be on board, but here's one explanation. It's what got us here. It's the reason we're talking right now. From the sense that, you know, as apes or primates, we were fighting for our territory in, in groups, probably, and we're fighting for the survival of our species. Although, 
one of the members of that those that species is ourselves, which is why we have survival instinct, right? So that makes sense. So it's even then it's not really, you know, selfish because we're one member of the, the species, right? And then by even increasing collaboration and developing human languages where, where you can develop, you know, a lot of thought, uh, a lot of complex thoughts. And then I read an article, which if you read my blog, you would know, and it's that reason, rationality, was evolved as a defense mechanism against being fooled once language was developed. So when people got into societies, I did read your article, but I don't remember that part. Oh, okay. Well, it, it was reason was developed as a defense me mechanism when complex societies were forming. And I mean, people allegedly, were right? Like, yeah, it's one of the, the theories. The theories correct, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's one of the theories. I like it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and everything. Yeah, so, so to, we to avoid are, getting fooled by tricky people when language is invented and more complex and tricky sentences and, and yeah, ideas. Yeah, because a monkey be. can't really lie to a monkey, which is why right. it doesn't need reason. Yeah. And uh, it's also, you know, a good argument for why that's a good theory is that <laughs> we're better at spotting others' mistakes than we are at our, uh, our own mistakes. You know, the, all these biases, confirmation bias, blah, blah, blah. You're not going to have confirmation bias when you're telling something to me, right? I mean, okay, unless, I mean, I'm trying to prove my point, but when, when you meet a no new person and they express an opinion, you're going to be like, oh, well, this is wrong with it, this is wrong with it, but you can't look at yourself and say those things. You're better at spotting other people's, other people's mistakes than your own, mm -hmm. essentially. So, that's one of them. I think just the very reason we're here today is because we did all the things that my theory contains, which is societal advancement, right? Collaboration to achieve survival and development. Now, Ooh. if that's not the best reason for you, then there's another one. If we biologically evolved, you know, through the natural selection to like the things which are profitable to us, and we are just animals, blah, 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 then the things that bring us pleasure are also going to be all those societal advancement things. And this is why I heard Joe Rogan discussion on it. Fishing feels so good because you're sitting there for four hours doing nothing. It feels bad. I, what he said is, Fishing feels boring. Fishing is boring until it's not. Which is when you, f when you catch that fish, you know, maybe we, we've never felt that. What it means in your brain, deep in within your, you know, neural structure is that now you're feeding your family for the night. When mm. you catch that big fish, you know, all these men with, you know, fish pictures, uh, pictures on, their, on their, their profiles. Exactly. What it means is, okay, I'm feeding my family tonight. And that's, Something that is much more basic than, or not basic, but primal than going to the uh, supermarket and buying the, you know, the, the same meat. It's just ingrained in our, in our brain. And these are the two reasons, right? So one, we wouldn't be here if we hadn't done what I'm proposing to do. Okay. And two, it's also going to make you feel good because evolution coded you for it to feel good. And what is feel good? I mean, it's the thing that utilitarians take as their, like, the ruling thing of their, you know, moral structure. But I'm saying, okay, well, there's a precedent to that. And there are things that exclude all the problematic implications of taking pleasure as the primary thing. For example, I don't think you should be, you know, if... If you're the person who feels the most happiness in the world, I don't think you should go on slaughter streaks. Slaughter streaks. Right? You're just an exhilarated person with two katanas going around the street. Yeah. That's that's the thing. Okay, well, the second one seems like more basic, uh, like a more basic justification of, well, you know, we do these things to advance society and it feels good and that's a sort of like a genetic evolutionary explanation of of it feels right and so that's why we do it but i think with the first one it, it, it's the question still stands is like okay uh it's what got us up to here and with all this technology and and the fact that we're living right now is cooperation and societal progress 
but then again why does that matter but yeah, 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 did you want to comment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I developed it when I was 17 and I haven't reread it since because I'm afraid that it's not good. But from what I remember is it's okay, let's start from the very, very beginning. What do we know? And we know that we came to be. Either, if that's the Big Bang or God, all we know is that we came to be, okay? Okay. What, what do we not know and strive to do the most? Answer the question. What question? What is the meaning of life? <laughs> so, I know <laughs> that was a pretty good intonation. So, wh how do we? What is the most reliable way in which we answer questions? Science, right? Every time we ask a uh, a question and answered it, it was through the scientific process of studying cause and effect. And my my ultimate conclusion was: look, it got us up to here. So there. Are, Two possibilities. There is a purpose in life, aka if it's God, we're just, I don't know, going to keep striving towards identifying a scientific proof of God or something. And then the purpose is just to serve God. So that's fine. Or there isn't a purpose, really, or a way to find God. But what he would want us to do is probably advance anyway. Okay. Or there's the biological thing, where I guess the peak of scientific evolution would be to meet an alien life form, I would say. Because then I think that would answer a lot of questions. Because, well, either they would absolutely destroy this planet, which, I mean, I, they probably would. <laughs> or we could eventually find a way to communicate with them. And if we find that, you know, realistically it's not us who is going to get to them it's it's them right at least for the, the duration of our lives and what that's going to answer is either or they don't know what the purpose is either <laughs> and we're just going to keep searching together but at least it's going to be like you know it's like when, when you're the only one think imagine you're the only guy in the class thinking something and then you're like oh man I, I, maybe i should know this and someone else raises their hand and they ask the question you feel much better and we would feel much better about not, not having an answer um, because we're probably just, you know, a unicellular organism that happened by chance and then evolved to what we are now. And yeah, I mean, in the biological evolution thing, there isn't really a purpose because I can't really like find, find a you know counter counterpart to that because purpose, I guess it would take intentionality or something of a celestial being. So in any case, if we find another alien life form, and I think Neil deGrasse Tyson said this, it, he said, the difference between the intelligence coding genome of an ant and us is around like 1.1% or something. Okay, but we're yeah. that much smarter than an ant. So if we encounter an alien... I don't think... <clears throat> I think it was a monkey. Oh, my bad. Yeah. I mean, oh, it doesn't matter. If there's a small yeah, difference matter. between us and an ant or us and a... Like a 1% difference, right? Yeah, something like that. And essentially what he said is, look, if, if an alien life form gets to us, then it's probably thousands of years more evolved than us, which, which means that if they have even more than 1% difference from our intelligence coding genome, the difference between our intelligence and theirs would be as big as between us and an ant, which is unimaginable when you're looking up, right, in terms of higher than human intelligence. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I can't even imagine that. So, right. And to that extent, if they do choose to spare us, well, we're probably going to have this answered if we do collaborate for some reason. And they haven't found a purpose. Well, either they have found a person, purpose and they'll probably share us, share with us, or they haven't found a purpose and we can feel good about knowing that, okay, these people who we are essentially ants for that they haven't found the answer so it's fine for us to not know the answer so i was a science obsessed person and i thought that virtue was found by advancing humanity in the scientific sense but i don't think that's where it stops now i've kind of expanded my horizons to you know everything else being a virtuous janitor or being a philosopher okay yeah it does seem like you you're like not that it's a bad thing, but you're like pushing back the problem, right? It's like, oh, I, you know, basically, we don't know the meaning of life. And then 
it's either on God or on aliens. And if aliens don't know, then that's fine. And I, I, I think ultimately I would agree with you. And my view is sort of well described by by Viktor Frankl. I think I, I sort of agree with him on a lot of what he says. And he he comments on something that he calls the, the super meaning um, on page 118. He says, uh, the ultimate meaning necessarily exceeds and surpasses the finite intellectual cap uh, capacities of men. Uh, in logotherapy, we speak of this uh, in this context of a super meaning. I should start talking like that. So in the puzzle theory we speak of <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 well that's super meaning right that that's something that's probably the factor that uh makes nihilists nihilists right it's like oh, i think every I see. every human uh every human feels that life has a meaning but it's so frustrating to not know what that meaning is that you're like i, I need to be like hyper rational i need to be hyper rational and ra rationalize this and read my blog uh read it um and uh and find a meaning you know you want you want humans want to be smart you know we're at the top of the food chain we dominate planet earth and we want to know everything and we need to find a meaning but maybe the 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 truth is that you should accept that you don't know it but uh do you want to comment on that or i was just gonna say it's like uh you're confusing a local maximum for a, a global maximum an absolute maximum yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And so his comment on just the meaning of life uh, in general, I think it is, is insightful. He says on page 109, he says, <laughs> he says, at each situation in life, as each situation in life represents a challenge to man and presents a problem for him to solve, the question of the meaning of life may actually be reversed. Ultimately, man should not ask what the meaning of his life is, but rather he must recognize that it is he who has asked. In a word, each man is questioned by life, and he can only answer to life by answering for his own life. To life, he can only respond by being responsible. Thus, logotherapy sees in responsibleness the very essence of human existence. And so what I think that means is that you have to realize that nihilism just doesn't work. In in, in humans' head, I f heads, it feels like nihilism doesn't work. It, evil, even... You know, Nietzsche, uh, after the death of God, is now like, okay, we have to look for a meaning. Now it's up to us to, to, to find a meaning. Can we do it? Can we do it? And I don't know. The, I think I feel like it's a basic assumption that there is meaning to life. And embracing that and taking on responsibility and uh, living like life has a meaning and em embracing the struggles and embracing everything, you know, embracing struggles is Viktor Frankl's thing, is, is our job. Mm. yeah what do you have to say i was just gonna say it's it's great it's cool it's a good passage but it's wouldn't you say it's a good remedy for people who are still stuck on step one like you kind of it, it's a good remedy to pass on to step two right but it doesn't take care of the problems which we later come to which are i now, see i see right that's true yeah, yeah that, that, which isn't yeah, to say yeah. it's useless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like but, people and I, are and, on step one sometimes. Yeah, I agree with you. And he does, you know, develop it further. And I know he has theories of like there's uh, three different meanings which people can have, which is like production or love or whatever, you know, advancement of society, caring for other people, stuff like that. But I, I, yeah, to to summarize my point of view is that we have to assume that life has a meaning because it it just feels that way. You know, nihilism just doesn't feel right. And then after that, you you take on responsibility and you you embrace that life has a meaning. Uh, and yeah, I, I would say that it life life's ultimate purpose, even though we don't know it, has to involve other people and and you know sort of a communal objective. Right. So let's backtrack to when you said life has to have a communal objective, right? Because I like that part. And what I would like to say, you you mentioned two things, right? <clears throat> uh, what were the categories you said? I I I'm, just I from memory doesn't matter. Them, just but... the two, the advancement of society. Is some yeah, the, the the I'm not I'm not quoting. I don't know what they are, but uh, I said like product a productive goal of like you produce scientific research or you produce something or uh, loving yeah loving, a loving goal okay. yeah yeah okay. So I think both are kind of important, and probably the average person will have a mix of the two. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. I remember an episode of The Partially Examined Life uh, being critical of Socrates 
that essentially abandoned his family, the historical Socrates, abandoned his family and instead was walking around town questioning people about their beliefs. And, you know, to anyone who knows Socrates, he was essentially pissing off the other citizens to, I mean, it seemed arrogant where he just wanted to be right, but also he wasn't really arguing for anything. So he had all the factors to piss people off and they were really critical about, oh, he had been in his family. But when you think about any common person knowing the name of one philosopher or three philosophers, name three philosophers, I'm pretty sure the one of the one of the re recurring names is going to be Socrates, right? And I think that means that what he achieved through history and for humanity is a little bit greater than you know what isn't talked about. Let's say like this to this day, or unless you dig around and really go into the nitty gritty of it, is his relationship to his family. But what is talked about is everything he did achieve and. Plato's books and his representation and ideas in him. So I feel like certain people can take that to the fullest, right? Maybe you would think of, I don't know, I want to say Buddhists, but whatever. Just minimalist monks who are out there just, I don't know, leading a loving community that where you learn to accept everyone for who they are and um, maybe some actually good religious leaders or something who are living for, for others and not marrying because that that's what religion said or something and leading churches and sacrificing themselves for others or someone like peter singer right who does everything for for others well again not everything for others i just mean in, in a loving capacity and others who will take the societal advancement to a more global effect and it might seem at the beginning more counterintuitive to maximize that because you feel like it seems as though you're an unloving person. And I'm sure a lot of philosophers in history have struggled with that um, view of them where they were out there, you know, sitting in a basement being very mean to everyone who approached them, but they had all these graded ideas and I said graded, great, all these great ideas and they did something that marked humanity in such a big way that there are literally university classes about them. And in a way, that's almost more glamorous in the sense that if you're a loving father and worked as a virtuous janitor and made the, the lives of countless children better by, you know, keeping them in a clean environment or something, you're not going to have a university class about you. But it's just, you know, th through a lot of my life, I've been criticized for, for, you know, not saying hi to people or something like that. But what if that's what I necessitate to advance society? And that's who I am. And the way in which I want to achieve virtue is by writing my philosophy book, is by, you know, focusing on my work. And what impedes me to do that is having all the, you know, social niceties yeah small talk you know all the oh let's go to this event oh let's just, let's just go to this event let's just hi say hi to people and learn about people he loves events i love events so <laughs> i, I, I passive aggressive <laughs> so, so so i just think there's you know if you keep the the outlook of okay this is still for humanity but i'm not saying it's for you as a human i'm not you know i'm not my, i might not come off as the most pleasant person Essentially, what I'm trying to say is you have to take on a bigger perspective and say, okay, maybe Socrates wasn't a lo loving father or something, but does that mean that he didn't achieve more than the average person will probably achieve in their lives? Or we don't even have to compare in that sense. And yeah, I, I do think maybe, maybe he could have improved on that and you kind of have to find a balance. But if you find a balance where it's still 80% humanity oriented and 20% human oriented right where if you're out there just making the lives of the people around you better that's one thing and you can you can you know capitalize on that but don't forget to also advance humanity let's say maybe maybe a rich kid would be a pretty good example of that let's say he takes the big inheritance and then 
he gets a few friends and then just realizes all their dreams with that money but he never works a day in his life and just you know goes on trips but also his friends and loved ones they go on trips with him and he makes their life pleasurable and they're actually out there working but sometimes they go on these expensive trips like that's not enough I, I need more of you so wouldn't you say there's kind of a, a distinction where we're still working for humanity but because we're so programmed to and i would say that's an effect of globalization right we're not supposed to know more than like 30 people we're supposed to our brain is, thinks we live in villages or we know everyone, you know, we defend ourselves against other people in other villages who are lying and whatever. Yeah, that's how I justify not talking to anyone at university. There's too many people. It's not, my brain is not made for, yeah, for that. Yeah, I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> so what I'm trying to say is it's very instinctive and not thought out to think that a virtuous person is the one who is going to greet everyone with a smile. And that is not to say that I, I want to discredit that. There are great people who do that, that I know. But there are other ways in which you can advance society. And they're not lesser. They're just less easy to perceive. Because, you know, if, if ju you've just been the worst person to everyone in your life and you're out there in the basement writing a book about a theory that will rev revolutionize philosophy, it's not as easy to perceive your value for humanity until your death and in the moment i think you know one could realize more of what that is doing humanity and humans are the same thing but what we want to perceive is what we're programmed to perceive did that person you know wave to me and make me feel nice which isn't always what is required of them are we wrapping up I guess, unless you have something to say. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I guess the, you know, one sentence summary or something is is that... I, I have a really good quote. Pull up the, the document. I, I, I knew it was going to summarize everything we said. The meaning of life is to find your gift. The purpose of life is to give it away. Senor Picasso. I love that. I love that quote, don't you? Yeah. I mean, good. Again, I, I think it... No, no, but it, it combines it combines both of your of your points of humanity versus humans, right? You serve humanity by finding your gift. The meaning of life is to find your gift. Then, the purpose of life is to give it away. And so, your your gift ultimately has to have relations relation to to humans and to, you know, you can advance humanity, but humanity is composed of humans. And so, the purpose of your life is to give it away. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. I'm not gonna find a better summary. <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah. What what I was gonna say is to first realize that it, the meaning of life imposes itself on you that that's truly the way i feel and i feel like humans uh all over the world uh feel that way too is that you know nihilism just doesn't make sense you know you you have to embrace that life has a meaning and like victor frankl i i, I do also think that we can't really grasp it uh, entirely but you have to take on the responsibilities that uh life throws upon you and and you know uh strive to make humanity better and i do agree with you to, to some extent that i i i'm i think i'm less ambitious and i can't define it uh, as well as uh you know you want to but it does have to be human centered and and helping people that does feel to be uh, the answer i'm thinking about the thing figured it out rating maybe i wouldn't go 10 right because i think societal advancement could require an episode by itself or like Repushing, uh, repushing the problem, right? Like, okay, here's how you find happiness. Yeah, follow yeah. the meaning of life. Here's the meaning of life. Advance society. What's now. advanced society? <laughs> Let's figure out how much you want to uh, be mean to people, but advance society versus you. You know, uh, societal yeah. advancement could be altruism too, considering everything we've concluded now. Yeah, we could get it if we get a ten out of ten in altruism too and meaning of life. That would be is awesome. that 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 propagates backwards and like. If we get altruism, we get the meaning of life and we get... Retrospectively. Yeah, I guess. Man. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm pretty satisfied still. Uh, I'm pretty satisfied still. Uh, I'd say I, eight, I, by the way. You'd say eight? Okay. That's good. I'll say seven and you're going to write eight on the thing. No, I had no. 7.5? Yeah, but you round it up and then say eight. So... Right, yeah. This is a math. Like, so math so math when you write eight, you've, you've considered my rating of seven. You just rounded it up. Yeah, it's it's... 
it's factored in. I'm not putting my eight. It's your eight. It's our eight. It's our eight. And that's good. That's a great way to conclude it. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening. If you want more information or read my blog at thinkingbros.com or contact us at thinkingbros at gmail.com. And we'll see you next week. See ya.